Captain's log. Start date 0603 or 0604. It doesn't matter. Today we plot a new graph for data sets that are way beyond our means. Welcome to another episode of Hash to Find Join Podcast. I'm your host, Ronald Sosa. With that cheesy intro out of the way, I should probably figure out today's episode is going to be about data logging. Now, the bit that I actually want to talk to you about is the storing and filtering through the data because there's some really good ideas uh, with dealing with that, mostly because that's the part that uh, most people tend to not really think too much about and kind of leave it at last minute. Um, but before I, actually, uh, before I actually go ahead and talk to you about stuff like that, first I need to talk to you about um, the actual aspect of logging data. Now, as the name suggests, logging data is you taking some sense of reading and saving it. And there could be various reasons as to why you want to do that. And I do apologize if this, this is quite simple term, that's quite simple idea and, you know, you don't really need to be explained though, but you know, I feel like I helped to cover all the grounds. But for whatever reason, you need to store some data from whatever sensors. And it could be because the sensors, for example, you're trying to profile them because you want to figure out more about how they work and how well they work. Maybe you're trying to verify their specifications. Now, although I am not going to be talking about um, some of the useful, useful information you can get out of data, uh, data that you've logged, uh, that will probably be for specific videos based on specific sensors. But the very thing, the very first thing I want to talk to you about really is how, well, give you some of the ideas of how you can go about logging data. Um, now, we know some reasons why you might want to do that, and it doesn't have to be sensors, it could just be some equipment that you want to profile, maybe you've got a board, and you've got different points in the board where you want to check for temperature and kind of do a profile of the board so you know, okay, within this temperature range, the board behaves like this, you know, those are the kind of reasons. Now, I feel like I've gone quick enough, and I am going a little bit quick because the bit I want to talk to you about, as I said, is the store, is the dealing with the data you've already stored and kind of tools you can use for that. Because that's the bit we all tend to kind of uh, fall on if we're not really thinking about that. So some of the ways you can log data. Now, um, bear in mind that depending on the, your application or depending on what you're trying to read, you may not necessarily have enough storage to be able to deal, to deal with that. And so one of the first things you really need to think to yourself about is how quickly do you need to sample? What's the uh, sampling rate? Um, now, this is important because if you sample too much, more than you actually need, you will have more data than you actually want to go filter through. As I mentioned, you, you're likely to get to a situation where you create hundreds of megabytes worth of data. You may not necessarily need to actually go through all of that. You may only need like 10 megabytes worth of that if you over sampled the information. Now, if you don't know how often you need to re uh, sample the sensors or you don't know what rates because maybe you're trying to figure out how the sensors work and you just don't want to make any assumptions, you might just go ahead and log as quick as you can and generate that megabyte and kind of deal with it with them. Deal with it then. But once you've done that, then you can make a better educated guess as to how often you want to sample. Um, but my point, I should always, you know, I always like to point out is that really you need to try and, and figure out how you want to use the sensor. So, for example, if you're profiling a board and you want to figure out what their, how this, what's the temperatures like in different points on the board, because maybe the board is going to work uh, across a temperature range and some components run hotter than others and you don't you're not really too sure how two components heat are going to affect that particular part of the board you know you might want to kind of profile that and kind of validate that yourself um in that case for example then with temperature sensors it's actually not that bad you it depends which you get if you get a calibrated sensor for example say like the ds18 uh sorry ds18 s20 is it two s's yeah ds18 s20 which is a calibrated temperature sensor you know that every reading you get from it is going to be calibrated and surprisingly smooth, but you need to realize that there's going to be a response time, a time that it takes for the sensors to settle. So in which case, you know that the, the settling time may be like in the order of seconds rather than milliseconds. Uh, so therefore, you don't really need to be sampling every 100 milliseconds because you're going to get virtually the same reading quite often, especially when the resolution of the sensor maybe in the orders of one decimal point, maybe two, in which case you, you, you're you going to get the same reading quite often. So that sort of stuff helps, understanding what the sensor you're dealing with or the thing that you're using to sample or to take measurements with, understanding how often or how quickly they respond. But just because the sensor you have will respond quite quickly, it doesn't mean that the system that you're connecting to or the thing you're trying to measure is going to respond 
uh, just as quick. It might be quite a slow system. So, for example, say you got yourself a um, a, a precision uh, temperature sensor that can respond respond very quickly. The thermal mass on it is very small, so it can uh, uh, stabilize to whatever temperature is connected or whatever device is connected to to its temperature quite quickly. It doesn't mean that the actual board you have is going to re respond to temperature changes quite quickly. Maybe its thermal mass is quite high, and so therefore it's going to take a lot, of, a lot of time for that to change or to shift its temperature. So again, understanding how the system is likely to work will help you reduce the amount of data points you have. Now, if you're like me and you don't know any of that when you've just designed a board, and assume you've never designed this kind of code before and you don't have experience in this kind of thing, you might likely just go ahead and say, okay, just sample the hell out of this as quick as you can and we'll deal with the data set later. Or you may even go as far as uh, and just actually do the obvious and that is to limit the uh, the duration of the sampling. So you might say, okay, let's see what the system looks like in 10 seconds and see how, um, how much data we can, well, let's see how the system behaves within that. And that might even be able to give you a better understanding how often you need to sample. The point is trying to reduce the number of sampling rates helps in when it comes to actually dealing with the data on when you come to actually have to deal with the data later on. But that shouldn't be that shouldn't really be a big issue. I mean, you could argue that um, we are now in a, in a world where we've got very cheap uh, single uh, single board computers like such as the Raspberry Pi, which means that we can get away with using gigabytes worth of uh, SD card memory and we don't really need to worry too much about it. Just going to store it and deal with it later. And I don't, I don't blame you to think about that. I don't, I wouldn't blame you for thinking, you know, what's the point? We're just going to deal with it later. The, the thing is, you need to realize one thing, and that is that you might have gigabytes worth of data you need to sift through, but it's still going to take time for you to go through it. And if you decide to apply some sort of um, equation or any of the data, if you need to do, if you need to update any data set once you've received it, for example, you want to go through, and you've got a function written somewhere that goes through all the data and smooth it out for you. That will take time, time that you may not necessarily want to be spending, time that your um, your uh, employees may not want you to do, time that your clients, if you're a contractor, may not want you to be spending. So being smart about what you do with the data definitely helps. If you plan it, especially if you plan it, if you plan based on what you expect the system to provide you, uh, will definitely help. Now, bear in mind that that can also be a downside. If you plan for a system, you may not necessarily well, yeah, if you're planning for what you think the system's going to work, you may not necessarily have enough data points that to see things that you might not expect. So there are some pros and cons in there. But once, to be honest, once you've figured out how the system is working, you can then start playing around with maybe making that easier to go through. So, so the point I'm going to make is like with data logging, uh, you might be faced with quite a few different problems. So if you've got an embedded board, for example, and you may not have an external SD card connector, or you might not be able to plug in a memory card, uh, a memory card, or even an external flash altogether, then you might be limited to what you can log anyway. In some cases, um, like I've had it in the past where I've designed a board and the requirement basically meant that I can only use like the internal 512 block worth of um, data from within the, the um, from within the micro itself. But in that case, that compromise can be done because I wasn't logging to profile the system, I was logging just to verify things are working and I needed to have a trail uh, for the period that it was going to be out there. So it was nice to kind of see, okay, whenever, you know, whenever a system did something, then take its measurement and store it and that did it, that did the job. In that case, you can get away with having much fewer data points and it's fine. But you might not be in that case. So you might be thinking, what can I do then? I have a, syst I have a board that I need to log the sensors that it's reading. I don't want to... Um, break out the sensor to a different system altogether measure because it might not necessarily give me the same readings as it would do if it's on the actual system that it's going to go in. In that case, I would definitely suggest um, uh, routing out maybe a serial port from the micro and hooking that up to an external system that takes the measurements for you. So again, like for the system we're talking about, when I first was developing that board, what I did is I routed out that serial, as I mentioned, and I hooked that up to a Raspberry Pi and that was connected to a USB um, external drive because the data points, like it was, it was meant to be like a month's worth of data points. So it's going to be, I, I assume there's going to be larger than eight gigabytes. And it's a lot of data. You're probably thinking there's like eight, eight gigabytes a lot, but you know, it was required and there was various different sensors that needed to be measured anyway. And they all need to be time stamped and stuff like that. 
So an external hard drive, and it was good enough for the job that it did there. Uh, but if you're going to be dealing with having to having to log the data quite quickly, you'll soon find out that the bottleneck is usually the process of taking the sampling, uh, taking the, the reading from some sort of ADC or whatever periphery you've got to connect it to. You know, assuming that maybe you've got a temperature sensor connected to SPI or whatever, you might you soon realize that actually usually the bottleneck is the communication or the process of moving the memory from one place to another. So in which case you may have to do some compromises. Uh, if you're, to be honest, if you're logging, if you need to log data so quickly that the you're not able to send it through a serial interface, then you are better off designing in the memory you need for that kind of data logging on within the system. But that will also increase, increase the prices. But you know, I'm not going to go into too much detail. There's various ways you can data log. Um, even for example, if you if you if if you're finding that actually might be quicker, for example, to rather than um, Rather than taking the I2C uh, ADC and putting it straight through for serial, you might actually find that, that the DAC on the micro might be actually quicker than you sending it through uh, serial, in which case you may actually put the ADC on a Raspberry Pi to take, take samples from that or or something along those lines anyway. But, I, I'm, you know, I, I think I'm, I've covered enough with how you can get a log anyway. There's various ways you do it. But let's say you've taken the reading from your board and you now have Massive amount of data to, to sit through. Now, before we move on from that point, I would highly suggest that when you're storing it and you're going to store a lot of data that are quite large data sets, if you know what to expect, if you know what you need, it might actually pay you to actually put some smarts on the board that's doing the data logging to filter out events so that you only saves the bits that you need. Now, um, for example, if you know that uh, you're looking for some rapid changes within the readings. What you could do is you can say, okay, if the same reading uh, for the last 10 samples have been the same, or however long your averaging is going to be, or even better, if you've got a moving average there, for example, if you're taking in a moving average to filter out the signal anyway, you can basically say, okay, if the new reading is greater than this reading, which is basically a gradient check, um, or better known as thresholds, if this reading is greater than X amount, then we'll start data logging this next 10 seconds and do stabilizers, for example. And that kind of helps you reduce that data set. But let's just say we don't know that. We don't know what to expect. And it's a brand new system. We don't understand that we want to get as much information as we can to see it later. So we're storing the data. So let's assume you've got all this information coming through from the board. Um, there are various ways you can actually save the file or save the data. You could save it as, as, as a raw binary file. In which case, you're just basically writing a binary file into an SD card. And uh, assuming you're not writing raw to the SD card, you're actually using a file system, I should say. But if you sort of store as a binary, then you have the advantage that things are a bit more efficient and you don't have to waste any, any processing time on the micro to do the conversion between that to something that, say, a person can read. But the traditional method is usually to store it all into a ASCII-based file, and usually a CSV file. CSV is a comma-separated file which means that every line is usually one data point and any data that you're going to store in one line, for example, you're taking multiple readings from different sensors, say you've got four sensors, then you store four separate values separated by comma and they usually it's like numeric and you always make sure the delimiter has not been used within the actual um, ADC readings, for example. Um, and you might even put a timestamp, so you, maybe your first data that you've put on that line will be your time, and the next one might be your sensor reading, maybe the, the next comma separates the next reading, and so on and so on. And every line is a new data point that you're storing, again, new timestamp, new readings, and so on. The point, the problem is with that method is that you are actually wasting some microprocessing time to do the conversion, where if you were to do it the way I did it uh, on a previous project, which was to use a Raspberry Pi to take a reading from the board, and then let the Raspberry Pi deal with any conversions and storing it, then in that case, you're not having to waste too much time in the microprocessor and with the, within the microcontroller, you can actually send, uh, you can simplify the, the serial connection between the two and just send four bytes, four raw bytes if you want to. You, you can simplify it as easy as you want in that, in that in that regard. So yeah, you've done that. You've gone and sent the saved file into a, to a, you saved the data into a file, in which case now you're in a situation where you need to process the information. And if you save it into a CSV file, programs like Excel and, and Calc for uh, LibreOffice, 
I always kind of get the order wrong. Libre Office, Office Libre. I'm sure it's Libre Office anyway. But they, those programs uh, have the advantage of being able to open up CSV files and separate the data into columns and rows. And as you would, you know, if you've been using Excel, then you kind of know what I mean by rows and columns. Problems you find with things like Excel is that they have a limited amount of, they're not designed to deal with a, a huge amount of data sets. If you've got gigabytes worth of data that you stored, it's not going to deal with it very easily. It's actually going to struggle with it. In fact, in some cases for me, Excel just crashed and it wouldn't work. But there are other programs out there, but there are other programs out there that you can use that are free that will help you deal with stuff like that. For example, uh, there's a program in Windows called Datplot. I'll put it on the show notes, uh, which is, the, it's been specifically tailored for dealing with large data sets and plotting them for you so you can see graphs for them. If, I mean, to be honest, you could do things like split the data sets and only open up the Excel file based on what you want to see. Uh, and assuming you've have you know you you know hundreds of megabytes that you've done ignoring gigabytes, but it still applies with hundred megabytes. If you find that actually hundred megabytes of files is still kind of slowing down your system, you might want to split the file a bit further to be able to see the graph. But the disadvantage is that you're having to deal with opening multiple Excel files and remembering that that connects to that and it gets messy. And you know this is what I mean where um, planning it out really helps. But even that plot has limitations. For example, it tries to load the whole data set and then display the information in front of you. And it can do it very efficiently, but when you've got large amount of data, you can start very quickly noticing how slow it is, especially if you're running a, I would say, an average machine. Um, the thing people don't realize, things like cache built onto uh, to the processors, the amount of cache processors have built in, help improve this kind of process, and especially for Excel. Excel uses heavily uses the cache built into the microprocessor, not microprocessor, built onto the processor, uh, to basically smooth out and allow you to kind of process that amount of information on the Excel. So uh, having a high-end processor, say like an i7 with like 20 megabytes worth of cache would definitely help. But an average machine, like the one I was using when I originally started doing stuff like this, didn't have any cache anyway. It was like a core dual and it was like the cheapest end that you can get. Um, in which case, you probably end up doing what I did and that's kind of giving up on trying to use tools like that plot and just writing my own. And to be honest, if you if you're quite proficient in programming, it's usually the very first thing you tend to think about. Okay, I can't find a tool that I want to do. Let's write a script to deal with it. And if you've been using things like Python, for example, then you find that actually Python is very well suited for text file editing and manipulating and stuff like that. And that might you might be able to write a script that goes through and filters the information, and then you can then deal with the process data, which might be an order of magnitude smaller than what you've been dealing with. For example, you can write scripts. I mean, I'm not condoning, I'm not saying use Python, personally I use Node.js anyway, but the reason I'm using Python in this example is because most of the examples you tend to find online for processing text files tend to be uh, in Python anyway, but uh, but I would I would suggest that just stick to the scripting language that you're more efficient with anyway, because the kind of stuff you deal with both in Python and Node.js isn't that much big of a difference, especially when you're dealing with gigabytes worth of data sets, the buff still going to take time. And it's just a matter of just walking away and coming back when it's finished dealing with it anyway. So, But anyway, what I was saying is that with whatever scripting language you want to use, um, you can just go ahead and write some sort of processing or some sort of script that deals with opening the file, go sipping through the information and getting what you want to get. Now, I would suggest maybe using Node.js instead of uh, Python because in Node.js, there's a, it's a very, it's, for me, I find that it's very easy to put together a UI interface for dealing with plotting graphs uh, for example, using Electro, not Electro, uh, it, it was Electro, isn't it? It's Node.js Electro. It's the same, uh, um, yeah, it's the same SDK for uh, that was developed to do Atom, the text editor. I think it was Electron. Oh, I, I think it's Electron, not Electro, Electron, um, which is very, it's a very easy tool, a very easy library for you to go ahead and include to your Node.js project to quickly put together a user interface, which is very much HTML, CSS styling. Um, and there's loads of really good um, HTML libraries for plotting graphs. And so what I've done in the past, when I've had hundreds of megabytes worth of data, rather than processing it, I literally went ahead and read the first, say, 100 data points, plotted that, and then the graphing tool that I had is whenever you scroll to the left or the right, it would remove a few points and display the next few points. Now, the reason why doing something as simple as that is kind of nice, if you've never worked with that sensor before, you don't know what kind of 
what to what to expect from the data, then it's nice to be able to kind of scroll through the graph and see any signals that are coming through. So you can basically spot any interesting patterns which might help you to figure out how to create that trigger event on the microcontroller so that you only data, data log that aspect of the data. So for example, like if the data you're seeing might have some interesting peaks that are, that are only like, say, a few milliseconds apart, and you're only interested to see in that, then you can very quickly log, log uh, not log, very quickly write some code that would say, okay, if the gradient has changed this much within this time frame, and we know we're expecting a 10 millisecond gradient change, for these peaks, then we'll just data log at that point. So, you know, that kind of helps you with stuff like that. Or maybe you find that actually this, the, the only thing that you're interested in is when the peaks go to positive, um, within 10 milliseconds it goes to positive, then 10 milliseconds goes to negative, and then it goes quiet. That's the bit you want to data log very heavily on, but then reduce the amount of data points uh, or anything else. So you can kind of do stuff, stuff like that, which you wouldn't really be able to do um, on just w when you buy generic or generic data loggers out there. So it, it really does pay to be able to look at the data set you have, especially when you're trying to figure out new sensors and stuff like that. Now, I've been talking about CSV files, but actually what I want to try and introduce you to is a different way of storing your data. Rather than storing it onto a, into a text file, I, if you are in in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a situation where you can use a Raspberry Pi, or heck, if not even using a Raspberry Pi, let's say you do store the data into a CSV file, if you're in a position where you can now process the data, I would highly suggest using a tool, not a tool, a program called SQLite. Now, if you've used databases, then you probably already know what I'm on about. But SQLite is a very simplified, simple databasing tool um, primarily focused on the embedded environment where which takes very little memory to use and the um, and it's very tailored towards um, finding well very tailored towards dealing in harsher environments where the power may be unplugged so it has to deal with uh, data losses and recover from that very very easily but also because it's a very simplified uh, databasing tool in comparison to say something like SQL which is used on uh, servers for say websites uh, if you use WordPress or if you've seen things like um, I forget some examples here but if you've ever been to say Hackaday they might be using SQL or might be one of the other databases uh, where they actually store the information from the sites you know that kind of stuff but the SQL Lite is a very simplified very robust very minimal and supposedly a very good competitor to storing files directly the developers, developers keep comparing SQL Lite to you to, well, to you writing a program, uh, you writing a program that will read and write to a text file within the hard drive, they're basically saying that if you use SQLite, it will actually be more efficient and it gives you a lot more better benefits. And I agree with it, especially when I've been using it quite heavily recently for data logging, uh, because it, it, it does quite a few things for you that you may not be as efficient to do with a text file. For example, because you're able to store it into a database or into a database file, so I'm, actually before I actually go into that, I should point out how uh, it saves the files. So SQLite is basically a program that runs on your computer. Now, unlike other databasing tools, um, you have to give it a file, a, a name or a file or a location to where the file is located, and that file becomes the database tables. Tables is where you store your data sets. So if you imagine, um, I guess what the easiest way to explain this is, if, if you store your data log into an Excel file, that file that you've created, the one who rows in column, is a table. Or in the database world, that would be considered to be a table. A row is considered to be a single line of data, or a, 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 well, data that are all associated that have been stored together. So like I mentioned previously, if you've got a timestamp and four sensor readings, then a row may have four columns, you know, or five columns if you include the timestamp. So what the first column on that first row will be the timestamp. The next row on that same column will be the first sensor and so on and so on. And then the row below that, so row uh, two, if, assuming you're counting from index one, but in the database world, you actually index zero is your first row. So it's, you know, it's if you've been dealing with my controllers, then that should be quite an obvious thing to think about. But the in that sort of environment, you've got your data sets in a row. So you can, again, picture in the, in the way you deal with Excel files. So rows and columns kind of associate themselves as, as well with the tables in databases but the nice thing is that with databases uh, tables you can give names to the columns so you don't have to just go and read from one uh, you know read, read a whole row to get information just like with excel files you can query which is the term used for 
um, or interfacing with the tables, uh, reading and writing and so on, you can query for particular data sets. But the nice thing is that you can write a, which is it's, it's a human readable query, you can write a command that tells the database program, the SQLite, to go ahead and search or get or retrieve or modify or insert whatever data you want on the table. And it can do that quicker than it will be for you or what it would be for the traditional method of reading and writing to text files. Now picture this, if you've got a, a CSV file that has 100 megabytes worth of data, if you've ever written a program for reading and writing data to text files, then you know that you, it's very hard for you to go and skip to the middle line and find data sets stored in the middle line because the way data sets, the data are stored in CSV files, you you know it's, you have to go and process line by line or tell it to skip this many lines to get to it, but you don't know what's in that middle line. The nice thing about SQLite you don't have to write code to go and process line by line to find the information or line co or write code to say, okay, skip this menu and display this. You can just write a query saying, return me anything that has this data on it. So in your case where you have hundreds of megabytes worth of data, a data sets in a file, if you were using SQLite, you can very easily implement your algorithm for detecting this particular peaks. Now, let, I'll go back to that in a second about detecting peaks and how SQLite can make it easy. But let's go back to the example I talked about earlier where you can plot the graph. And the way I did it was that I was reading the first 10 data sets, displaying that, and then when I scroll, I, I, I drew the next 10 data sets and got rid of the last 10 data sets. So it kind of gave you this impression that you have this continuous scroll. But in reality, I was actually reading right into a file and I couldn't just skip between points. And there was, you know, it's very hard to do that with a, um, it's very hard to do that with a, with a CSV file when you're reading the writing, what well, you're reading to that in real time to implement this scrolling effect. With an SQL-like setup, you can very easily keep track of how many data points you've done. And every time you query, you can tell it offset the data, the, return me the next 10 data points and offset by this much. So you can very easily, when you start up your program, ask the SQL-like to tell you how many data points there are or how many rows there are in that data. And then you can say, okay, give me the first 10 data points and we'll display that on the graph. And when you scroll, you can say, okay, now give me the next 10 data points well, give me 10 data points, but give it an offset of this much. And the nice thing is, like with the example of, of scrolling, you can now click anywhere on the scrolling bar to skip back to the beginning. And rather than with my system, you have to go back and read through to try and find where you're at, uh, or write any complicated code for that. You don't have to do that. You just basically say, okay, we were, the person is, is clicked on this scroll, so we should be in this point on the, on the data set. So now return this 10 data points from this row. And it can do that very quickly for you. But... You can do more than just that. You can do one other thing, and that is you can actually implement, um, you can either get it to modify the data before it returns it to you. Uh, for example, you can write a query that can say, okay, give me the next 10 rows. So give me, return me a, the, return, me a re, return me the results of 10 rows being averaged out. And what you can do is it will go into the database. It will take the next 10 rows or how many you've set it up. It depends how you write the query, obviously but it can take the 10 data points and average out the columns that are associated to each other and return you a row of the average results of those two. So you can now very easily implement a averaging within the query of that file. So your, as far as your main program is concerned, it's been, you've, it's been returned 10 rows uh, that have already been filtered out and you can implement whatever algorithm you want with that. There is obviously a limitation on that. And if you are gonna be doing uh, more advanced stuff than just that, uh, and you're happy to kind of sacrifice uh, speed, then I would suggest maybe instead of using SQLite, maybe using something completely different, uh, which is still kind of like database, but it's no databasing, uh, or it's more like a document-based system, but you can use Mongoose. With Mongoose, um, it's more, because it's tailored for JavaScript, you can actually write functions that process the data. Now, it will obviously take up more processing time to filter the information, but if you don't mind doing that, you now have a database, just like you did with SQLite, where you now have a return function that will be called every time data needs to be processed before being returned to the function that actually needs to, to process the data. But sticking to SQLite, which is quite, um, a, quite uh, what's it well, it's quite low in memory footprint, but very quick, in comparison to reading and writing to a text files, you can use SQLite on something like Raspberry Pi, whether you're using Debian or Arch Linux or whatever it is you want to use. You can use that on Windows. Um, if you're using Node.js, you obviously can do that too. 
and he works in all major, all, pretty much all major um, scripting languages like Python and Node.js and stuff like that. Now, I would highly suggest giving that a go um, because uh, the point I'm making is like, although you could, um, come on, let me go back a second, you could use something like, say, LabVIEW, which has some really good tools already built in for processing that kind of stuff. Um, or you can use something like uh, MATLAB, uh, which is specifically tailored for dealing with stuff like that. Um, the difference is you're now writing a scripting, a scripting program that's tailored to your specific needs, which you can then use to, if in future, well, for future reasons, you may need to uh, implement some sort of production tool or even provide some sort of tools for your end customers to use your sensors or your equipment. You've have that already all built in, and you have a system for dealing with stuff like that. Now, the final advantage for using something like SQL Lite is that it's storing the data or this table of information, which would be whatever you just plotted, into a text file or into a, into a file that it has a particular format that it uses, which means that you can have two separate programs write into that file while the other one reading to it because it has built-in locking systems for dealing with two things reading and writing to it at the same time which gives you an amazing advantage over CSV files. And that is with a CSV file, you have to write the program that deals with handshaking between different programs, so the locking system, or using file locks, for example, in Linux for making sure two files aren't being modified and read at the same time kind of thing. This SQLite deals with that in the background. Your application doesn't have to deal with it. Your application just has to send out a query and just it comes back with the data when it's ready and deals with all the locking automatically for you. Now, the reason why I'm saying that's quite an advantage thing to do, because what you can do is you can have your system that's doing the data login, logging the data in real time. And you can, while that separate program, maybe you've written in Node.js, which is reading from a serial line, storing it, you can write a separate program that can try and read the information in real time to actually process the information so you don't have to wait for the data login. For example, you've got some sensitive equipment that has to run all day long data login, you don't really want to wait all day for that file to be free, which you would have to do so with a CSV file because while the system is writing to it, you can't read to it. You could try and copy and hope for the best. And in some operating systems, they kind of allow you to do that stuff, stuff like that. With SQLite, you can just query the information, get the latest data points as they're coming through and process the information as it's been written. And you don't have to deal with any of that hassle of locking, as I mentioned. So it's definitely something worth thinking about. So that's what I'm talking about with SQLite and what I wanted to introduce you with. And it shouldn't really make any difference how big the data set it is uh, that you're using. And if you want to use some of the more advanced, uh, something more advanced than SQLite, you can always use something like Mongoose or even MySQL if you wanted to. But obviously with SQLite, it's tailored for uh, embedded systems and it's tailored for dealing with, uh, basically competing with CSV files and stuff like that. You don't necessarily have to write straight into, into an SQLite. You can actually, on SQL database, you can just store things in the CSV files remotely and then write a program that reads that straight into an SQL file. It takes time, but it will give you some extra benefits, or at least I reckon it will do. So I think that's enough for this topic. I will leave it as that. If you did find this interesting or if you want me to expand more about data logging, maybe profiling with sensors, or maybe some of the stuff that I've been doing with databases, uh, do let me know. But that is it for me. If you have any questions, feel free to go over to Twitter. My username is Optical Worm, especially if you're feeling sociable. Uh, this podcast and company has their own Twitter account. It is hashtag elec. Uh, but you can always go head over to the project page for this podcast on my website and head over to the comments and leave your messages there. Uh, I'm, I'm always happy to kind of answer any questions you guys have there. So that's it for me. See you later. Bye.